Welcome to the Security Weekly News wrap up for the week of 10 January 2021 from offsite. Uh, the government, the FBI, Mimecast, Ubiquity, Cisco, and the German police. All this and show wrap ups on Security Weekly News. This is Security Weekly for security professionals by security professionals. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. It's the show that keeps you up to date on the latest security news twice a week. Your trusted source for accurate security information and expert analysis. It's time for Security Weekly News. As technology continues to evolve and expand, so have the attackers that put our critical systems in jeopardy. Core Impact from Core Security is a penetration testing tool that safely finds vulnerabilities using the same techniques of adversaries. With certified exploits and wizards that guide you through critical pen tests while maximizing the time of advanced testers by automating their routines. With Core Security, you can safeguard your infrastructure by limiting access, detecting threats, testing for security weaknesses, and efficiently monitoring data. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash core security. Do you know where your organization's crown jewel data is, whose data it is, what it contains, and if it's flagged, tagged, and classified accurately? Defense In-Depth requires discovery in-depth. At Big ID, they help organizations uncover dark data, classify sensitive and regulated data, meet compliance requirements, and take action for data on-prem, in the cloud, and everywhere in between. Learn more about how Discovery In-Depth can change the way enterprise organizations find, classify, and protect sensitive data at securityweekly.com forward slash big ID. Increased attacks, skill gaps, talent shortages, expanding attack surfaces. Cybersecurity and IT teams face these real issues every day. CyberAfer Teams is the number one NIST aligned DoD 8140 and 8570 compliance certification and skills training platform. CyberAfer Teams makes managing teams easier, guarantees measurable training outcomes, and keeps your team's skills sharp to meet today's biggest security threats. And did you know 96% of the Fortune 500 have employees training on CyberAfer? CyberAfer Teams, now you know. Visit cyberA.it forward slash solve to solve your team training challenges. All right, I'm Doug White from Roger Williams University. Welcome to the Security Weekly News wrap up show. Let's talk about the show topics from this week. Uh, on Application Security Weekly number 136, John, Matt, and Mike had Andrea Serban, uh, the co founder of FuzzBuzz, on to talk about, well, what else? Fuzzing. Uh, this segment was uh, basically them talking about how to use fuzzing in uh, app security and the AppSec space. And also they talked quite a bit about how to deploy fuzzers. So if it's something that you're interested in, and a lot of people are interested in fuzzing and fuzzers for testing these days, I would say check this one out. On Enterprise Security Weekly 213, Adrian, John, and Paul, uh, also and Tyler uh, Shields, covered the news in the first segment. And in the second segment, the host talked about, do you know where your assets are? Uh, and in particular, the first two items uh, they were talking about on the Center for Internet Security's list of top 20 critical security control. Very interesting topic to me. Uh, it's something we've been preaching about for a long time. It's like actually close to 20 years now I've been preaching about, you know, understanding your digital assets. Uh, even, you know, as long back as I can remember doing audits, you ask people about, you know, where is the business, where is an office, how many desks do they have, and all this kind of stuff. They were, you know, they were on it. They had an inventory system and all this stuff. You start asking them about where their servers are located or where a particular app is located on those servers, and they often had no idea. And uh, in fact, I remember doing an audit once where they didn't even know that they had an AS400 that was sitting in somebody's basement. I mean, if you can imagine that, they, we, we traced it because we saw IP uh, packets. And we were going, where are these going? And they were like, I don't know. And I'm like, what is this system? And they're like, oh, uh, yeah, that's one of our customer management systems. And I'm like, where is this IS400 located? And they had no idea. And it turned out that the person who managed it took it home with them and was running it out of their house. It was crazy. And the person was no longer employed by them, but they were still actually supporting that AS400. And it was a weird love story with AS400. On the third segment, uh, Chris Blask, the Global Director of Industrial Control Systems, uh, security at Unisys uh, joined in to talk about the D-Bomb Consortium. 
Uh, this is a Linux Foundation product project, which allows the sharing of information with third parties and allows the digital bill of materials blockchain to share the software bill of material. Very interesting thing uh, to me. It's good to see more ICS uh, people getting involved in the security space. Uh, a lot of concerns now around industrial control systems, uh, something a lot of people didn't even know what it was just even a few years ago in the security space. And now seeing that things are getting formed and people are starting to address uh, this critical infrastructure is, is really uh, makes me happy because I've been, again, I've been preaching about that for a while. On Business Security Weekly number 202, Paul, Jason, and Matt had on Patrick Orzechowski. Uh, he's the VP of R&D at DeepWatch. Um, they, they were actually talking about why DeepWatch chose Splunk as the SIEM solution, which uh, delivers uh, its managed detection and response services to customers. So uh, a pretty interesting segment there uh, about why they, they made those decisions. So I, I found that to be pretty, uh, pretty germane. In the second segment, uh, they covered a bunch of stories, how BSOs bri uh, bridge the gap between corporate boards and cybersecurity. So if you're in that space, seven, and if you're watching that show, you're probably in that space. Uh, seven cybersecurity priorities CISO should focus on for 2021. Five questions uh, CISO should ask prospective corporate lawyers. I, I thought that was a great, uh, a great one there. Where to focus security resources uh, mid and post pandemic? Because we're now sort of in the like late stages of the pandemic, hopefully, and we're going to you know pretty soon be dealing with the post pandemic world. Good leadership is about asking good questions, and here are three ways you can use negative feedback to improve your career. Well, I got plenty of that, so I probably should start using it better. Um, on Security and Compliance Weekly, number 58, Jeff, Josh, Scott, and Liam Downward had on Jim McKee. Uh, he's the founder and CEO at Red Sky Alliance, and they were talking about the sunburst slash solar winds hack at this point in time. So if you're looking for more updates on, on that, uh, that are in depth, uh, all the, the guys were talking about that. Uh, the second segment basically continued, but they changed the topic a little bit to talk more about the cleanup. Uh, efforts as a result of Sunburst. On the Security Weekly News, number 93, uh, Jason Wood talked about new instructions from Britain's High Court that basically said uh, you can't indiscriminately hack people. And um, they were basically talking about uh, something very similar to the United States, which has a what is called a FISA warrant. And FISA warrants were created after 9-11, uh, they allowed for sort of very, very open-ended blanket warrants that covered not. It was a very, very different process for wiretapping and 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 breaking into things. Britain has now said you can't do that. So if you want to hear Jason talk about that, it was on the news on Tuesday. It was a pretty interesting uh, article there on Paul Security Weekly number six eight zero last night. First segment up had Ryan Noon. Uh, he's the co-founder and CEO at, uh, at Material Security, and he was talking about the importance of resilience in the protection of cloud stored data. And um, they, had, they had quite a few uh, things to talk about there, including email security and so forth. And, and you know, I, again, anytime we're talking about cloud data, it's definitely a relevant topic for pretty much everybody now since we're all storing more and more data in the cloud. Uh, in the second segment, John Gorenflow, the founder and principal consultant at Fundamental Security LLC, was on to talk about ubiquity vulnerabilities. Uh, this is I, I had I covered this story to, on this show as well, uh, but ubiquity had announced those vulnerabilities, and they had a lot of discussion about that particular data breach on the 11th of January, uh, and of course they covered the news. My favorite thread of the week is going to have to be throwing more government at the same old problems. Um, I, I'm not a huge big government fan. I, I'm not a no government fan. I'm, I'm not a nihilist or an anarchist or any of that kind of stuff. But I definitely am concerned when I'm, the government doesn't work together. So I, this story that, that I got this from was the State Department uh, wants to get in on the, on the budget, I guess. And government is all about budget and, and acquisition of budget and power. Um, I hate seeing more departments being created um, even though I know they need better cybersecurity, but when they create new departments, 
that don't necessarily have a mission that crosses government boundaries, it gets to me and starts bothering me a lot. But this week, uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, in the last days of his uh, tenure as Secretary of State, announced the creation of a new division called the Bureau of Cyberspace Security and Emerging Technologies. And the acronym is CSET. Um, so here's my gripe. A year and a half ago, uh, the, the State Department notified Congress that they had the intent to form something like this. And now, instead of it getting formed 18 months ago, they're trying to put it to, throw it together in the last days of Pompeo's tenure as Secretary of State. Uh, again, I mean, I don't have any problem with doing things the last minute and do them myself. And, you know, maybe this was one of those agenda items that got, you know, fell through the cracks. Or, of course, there's, you know, depending on who you listen to, there's all sorts of different political ramifications of this creation. Um, but this was just another, you know, case where the State Department delayed a cyber program until the last minute. And now they're trying to throw it together, get some one of their people appointed before they have to leave office and all this kind of stuff. Uh, they were supposed to form an office of cyberspace policy in 2018, but they hadn't done that either. Uh, and now they've created a really narrowly focused office that, you know, they didn't create a comprehensive department or a group that could focus on cyber issues at a higher level. And, and they did it with less than two weeks left before they all have to pack up and leave. So they're probably going to try to rush through an appointment, put somebody in charge of this that's, you know, on their side politically and then they have to leave and hopefully leave this poor person holding the bag, trying to, you know, foment their agenda after the fact. Um, the big criticisms in Washington was that, you know, it was the same thing I'm complaining about. Here's another silo uh, formed that has a very narrow focus and it doesn't really seem to address all the big cyberspace issues that are out there. You know, this is, so I compared this to Space Force. You know, it's like, I mean, they, they created this thing called Space Force, which doesn't have a very clear mission. They allocated resources, stole a logo from Star Trek, uh, you know, and they, they did this kind of thing very clumsily. And, and now it's just another silo where information gets held. Um, this is so this CSET is going to be another group that's not focused on collaboration across federal, state and local groups. Uh, but it will certainly draw some of those sexy cybersecurity budget dollars over to the State Department. So I just get frustrated when we build more silos instead of finding better ways to research, share, and address serious threats. It, it usually just creates another ineffective group that is, I don't think, going to have a real mission, like, say, Space Force. And I, you know, and, and I did think Space Force was a really dumb move at the time, kind of like the move of firing Chris Krebs because he told the truth. You know, I, I get really frustrated with that kind of stuff, too. But, in uh, you know, in about a week, we'll get a whole new bunch of yahoos in there to create a whole different movement in a different direction that will probably not be any more effective. But, hey, Mr. Biden, call, call me. OK, I, I'm, I'm here uh, right now. I'll take your call even now. Um, I swear for the last time, don't forget that Joff Dyer is running his Enterprise Attacker Emulation and C2 Implant Development course that starts on the 19th of January. So if you go to Wild Bus Hack and Fest uh, or Anti Siphon uh, and sign up, uh, you can still probably get in that class if you're interested. And, I, and that's the last time. Sorry, Joff. But the class will be over by the next time. Uh, all right, so the news. The FBI is trying to develop a new strategy to deal with better tracking of foreign hackers. So here we go with more. Uh, this primarily is coming out of the solar winds hack and the fact that we just continue to see these kind of attacks. And now these supply chain attacks have gotten the attention of the FBI. I'm sure they get a lot of calls about this and they're trying to put this together. The National Cyber Investigative Joint Task Force uh, did up their higher their focus to a higher level in the Bureau last year, but this is now going to create uh, a new senior FBI official role focused on, an, on offensive cyber operations, sanctions, and all the usual approaches to international pressure in the cybersecurity realm. Law enforcement has been playing catch-up, in my opinion, for a long time in cybersecurity, but they're slowly very slowly, you know, elevating cybersecurity to the same level they have always put on other types of crime. Uh, so maybe this is a step in the right direction. Uh, we can only hope. A site called Solar Leaks is selling data that they say was stolen from some of the many companies that have been breached in the SolarWinds uh, sunburst attacks. 
uh, supposedly, and, and I'm going to keep saying supposedly because in this article, there was a lot of sort of hedging about is this real or is this just a scam? Um, apparently, according to the article, Microsoft's source code is for sale for $600,000 which sounds a little pricey to me. I mean, maybe not. I don't know. What do you do with Microsoft source code that's worth that much money? I mean, I guess you could use it maybe and write, you know, I, I don't know. But it, it, it apparently Cisco's source code is available for half a million. Now, the interesting part was Cisco stated that there is no, quote, no evidence that their source code was actually stolen, by which, I mean, I guess... They, they haven't looked at it because I doubt Cisco wanted to pay half a million dollars to see if their source code was actually on this, uh, this uh, solar leak site. Other products listed were FireEyes private red team tools for, for the discount price of $50,000, solar wind source code for $250,000, and, and I'm not making this up, if you subscribe uh, to, you know, for only $1 million, a bargain sounds like, you get the whole tamale including the teaser that more is on the way. So, you know, wow. Um, <laughs> is it, but is it real? And do you want to shell out a million bucks to some random dark website? I, well, I guess it's not random. Uh, anyway, there's a whole lot of detail in this article about what's there and what's not there. Uh, you know, I think I'll just wait for the movie to come out. Uh, I'm not going to shell any cash. Ubiquity, uh, the ubiquitous network product manufacturer, or, or maybe it's eponymous. Uh, uh, that's probably both. Uh, they announced that their customers should change their passwords and enable two-factor authentication right away as they had a major breach on the 11th of January. Now, there was an, a widespread outage of their cloud services on the 10th of January, which makes you wonder if these two things are related. They haven't said yet. There was an extensive discussion of this on Security Weekly last night. So if you want to hear more about you want to read this article or you want to go to Security Weekly and hear what everybody had to say about this on a whole segment last night, uh, probably worth checking out. And if you use Ubiquiti's product, you may want to change your passwords and enable two-factor authentication. Like, right, like, don't don't listen to the rest of this. Go, go do that right now. The German police have shut down Dark Market, uh, it, which is the largest current sort of group that's selling possibly illegal material a la Silk Road, etc. Uh, this is the latest rendition of Pirate Bay, and they reputedly had 2,400 vendors and 320,000 completed transactions um, on there. An Australian man was arrested on the border of Denmark. Uh, and, you know, the, the German Denmark, uh, German Danish border up there uh, and is accused of running the site. So apparently this was uh, based on the Cyber Bunker hosting service, which uh, was out there. And a Cyber Bunker, if you aren't familiar, is, is uh, apparently housed in a bunch of old NATO sites. So these were like NATO bases and things, and, and they were in the Netherlands and then in Germany. And this was being used as a backbone for dark market. The site sells drugs, info, porn, child porn, pretty much exactly what you would expect on a Pirate Bay style site. Um, it, it, I mean, most of you have probably been on the dark web and seen these kind of sites uh, being run. Uh, my guess is that pretty much every you know illegal marketplace, and there have been many, many of them throughout the history of the world, uh, and they've always been there selling illegal stuff and questionable goods and, and what have you. This one will probably pop up again somewhere else pretty soon. Mimecast announced on Tuesday that it had been hacked uh, and that hackers were spying on customers. The hack was done using a compromised certificate responsible for securing Mimecast connections to Microsoft Cloud Services. Um, Mimecast makes primarily email security process products, so hence the name. Uh, MIME and SMIME have always been these like tools that you know basically take email and convert it into a form that could be processed across the interweb. Um, they, but MIMECast did say that approximately 10% of their customers had been affected by this hack, but that only a very small number of that 10% were being specifically targeted by a sophisticated hacker. Some anonymous sources, so at the end of the article, some anonymous sources reported that they believed it was the same group that did the solar winds attack. So nation state APT stuff uh, there. 
Cisco announced that 68 high severity and two other flaws will not be patched uh, in end of life devices. So um, like a lot of times when stuff gets in that end of life process, it's just not something they're going to focus on. And of course, they have every incentive to not focus on end of life devices because, hey, that gets you to upgrade, right? Almost all of these threats were related to how credentials were handled in the HTTP server of the web-based management interface of these devices. So Cisco's had a lot of struggles with their web interfaces. Um, the flaws can lead to remote code execution, root with root privilege, denial of service, and a, a, a you know, whole stack of other problems. Uh, these are basically Cisco small business routers. They are in the end of life process. So, you know, good advice regardless of where you are in the life cycle. You really need to protect those uh, management interfaces on devices. I'm always shocked when I see people that either have outward facing, you know, HTTP web interfaces for management or they have in band management interface, you know, console connections to devices in their networks and pen testers, obviously very well aware of that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, protect this stuff, uh, even if it doesn't have known flaws. And finally, um, so apparently you can get a free, it was described as a bag of marijuana. Um, you know, <laughs> these kids today with their bags of marijuana and reefer and, and all that stuff. Uh, <laughs> Um, you remember those high, I don't know, you may not, you may not be old enough, but I remember those high school lectures about the dangers of marijuana and, you know, they would have some, you know, sheriff up there telling all the students about, it's often called reefer, uh, and you, you can tell it by its distinct aroma and, you know, half the people in the auditorium like had been smoking a reefer before they came into the, uh, to the auditorium warnings about how smoking, a smoking a single reefer, I remember this very, smoking a single reefer can lead you straight into the perils of heroin and other hard drugs. Yeah. You know, that old, that old saw. But anyway, apparently in, in Washington, DC, you can get a free bag of marijuana. If you have received the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, the program is being run by a group called DC marijuana justice. Uh, and they called this program joints for jabs. Uh, basically the pro they're trying to highlight their, uh, their initiative, which is to get federal marijuana reforms put in place. But in the meantime, they're, they're sort of taking advantage of a loop on the law, which does allow you to give away marijuana for free, apparently, in D.C. Uh, that's also true other places as long as the quantities. Uh, currently in the U.S., uh, many states have legalized recreational marijuana, medical marijuana, possession, and so forth. But it does remain illegal at the federal level. And, um, it's very confusing in general uh, when federal law and state and local laws are like completely contradicting each other. Um, the Obama administration was trying to do something with this, but after their term, I guess it went back the other way. Um, for instance, you know, in Rhode Island, it, marijuana is illegal, but it, except uh, if you have a, a prescription, but it is considered only a civil offense. So it's like a parking ticket. But in Massachusetts, which is very close to Rhode Island and kind of surrounds it, uh, it's legal. So it's kind of confusing when you go to mass, buy marijuana, and, you know, all the cars at the place have like Rhode Island tags. So it's kind of like those dry county things they used to try where, you know, there's like a five liquor stores on the county line on the other side. But, yeah, that kind of stuff beats me anyway. And that is the news wrap up for the week of 10 January 2021 in the time of plague. Uh, we are off next week, so I will see you again on the 26th of January with a new administration in Washington, D.C. Again, Joe, you know, call me. 